Good evening, everybody. I can see people are just starting to join. And for those of you that are eagle-eyed, you're right, I'm not Colin. Um, Colin is on holiday uh, today and tomorrow. So I'm Emma Malcolm. I am the Interim Director of Services at the Macular Society, and I will be looking after you this evening. Okay, Liam, let's give you a little introduction then. Um, so our speaker this evening is Liam Sullivan. Um, Liam is a consultant ophthalmologist with expertise in medical retina, intravitreal injections, laser treatment, Treatment and cataract surgery at Cambridge University Hospital, Addenbrookes. He leads the medical retina service in Cambridge and cares for patients with all types of retinal diagnoses, including inherited retinal disorders. His ophthalmology training was in Yorkshire with fellowship training in retinal disease and cataract surgery, and he runs the East Anglian Retinal Group Consultant Meetings, oh, that's a mouthful, and was previously the Regional Laser Training Simulation Lead. Um, tonight, Liam will be discussing lasers as treatment for patients with retinal conditions such as diabetic retinopathy and retinal vein occlusion, and he will explore all the various types of laser and when they are used. So Liam, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, evening everyone. I'm going to just see if this is all in order. So are you seeing my slides as hoped? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what works in practice sometimes doesn't work in real life. <laughs> I'll try again. How are we doing? No, all I can still see is just you, Liam. Oh, here we go. So yeah, you just got to change your view. And then we're good to go. There we go. Fabulous. Good. Okay. Thanks. All right. So this evening, I'm going to talk about laser in retinal patients. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a chat about what is laser. Um, I'm going to have a look and see about how laser works in the eye and specifically how it works within the retina. Uh, and then I'll talk about the different types of laser for the eye uh, when we use them. And in particular, I'll talk about something called PRP or panretinal photocoagulation, macular laser in its various forms, have a little look at other types of retinal laser, and then also the lasers that are associated with patients who have retinal conditions but are not focused onto the retina. Um, and uh, towards the end, then we, you can ask some questions and I will um, answer them as best I can. So I was very pleased on holiday when um, uh, we were playing Trivial Pursuit and this question came up because um, it was the first question I got right. And it was, what links the following words? And we've got spam, laser and scuba on a Trivial Pursuit question here. And I knew straight away, which some of you may know, either from laser or from the other things, that they are all acronyms. So SPAM is Special Processed American Meat, which I'd never heard of. SCUBA is an underwater breathing apparatus. And laser, and you can see why it's been called uh, by its acronym, is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So what does that actually mean? So... We now know what it stands for, but we've got to have a little think about light. And I'm showing here a picture of different wavelengths of white light. So white light is natural and has lots of different wavelengths and a different color spectrum from red to green to blue and all the others in between. And light's shining around everywhere. It's um, haphazard and moving in all different direction in different ways. Um, laser is different. Laser is not naturally occurring, um, it's manufactured. And what happens is we form, and now I'm showing the laser um, light rays all lining up together, is that we get a narrow beam of light with similar wavelengths all lined up, pointing in the direction that we want them to so that we can focus them. Now, this means that we can use them very precisely, um, and that's perfect for use within the eye. So how do we get this? We take a medium, so that might be a chemical or a, um, a gas. And the reason I'm telling you this is that sometimes you might hear your consultant or clinician or sometimes on your appointment um, referring to your laser by that medium. So it might be argon or YAG laser. Um, light is pumped in or electricity is pumped in and it, it stimulates 
um, this uh, medium into energizing. And the atoms release lots of energy and photons and they bounce around inside this device, um, getting stronger and stronger. And we're allowed to then, or we then can release some of them out of the end. So we release a little bit of the laser beam out of the end here, and you have a precise focused point. So essentially, laser is a beam of focused energy. Now, thinking about the eye, so you all know the eye very well, but it's always good to have a reminder of it. Um, a lot of what the eye does is those wavelengths that are flying around everywhere in white light need to be lined up. They need to be lined up through the front clear window here, the cornea, through the pupil, which is often dilated in retinal patients for view of the back of the eye, through the lens here, which we um, sometimes get a cataract in, through the jelly at the back of the eye, remembering that the front of the eye and the back of the eye is essentially two chambers uh, with a lens in the middle. So through that vitreous chamber at the back and hitting the um, retina uh, on the inside layer. That inside retinal layer captures the light that's now all been lined up by the front of the eye and it transfers it or turns it into an electrical impulse sent back via the nerve. So the eye is also um, a bit like an onion in that it has a layer upon layer upon layer. And um, the retinal layer has a support pump underneath, particularly at the central part in the macula. Uh, and that pumps, nourishes nutrients in, takes away waste products, but it also has a blood supply. And the blood supply is within the retina and underneath. Um, and that sort of brings important things in, including oxygen um, and takes away um, deoxygenated uh, blood cells. So here we can see a picture of the retina and the outside, which is the vast majority of the retina, is sometimes called the peripheral uh, retina. And that's your navigational field. That's your night vision. Um, it's actually not in color. All the color is the central part, that small postage stamp area, the macula that has millions of cells uh, working away, millions of little photoreceptors that transfer the light into an image. And if we look at that in cross section, we can see here that we have the blood vessels within the retina and underneath. We have these photoreceptor cells at the bottom, the outside of the retina. And we have this support pump, which we call the retinal pigment epithelium. And all of these are important if you want to have an idea as to how laser works within the retina. And sometimes you've seen this cross sectional slice uh, in a um, OCT scan in the clinic. So your retina here. This person has fluid underneath, and you can see the tiny little cells, the photoreceptors here, with the pump underneath. So how does laser affect the eye and the retina? Well, it causes a variety of responses because laser is not just one specific type. So um, depending on the type of laser and the part of the eye being treated, it depends on what actually happens. So if we think about um, the main use for retinal laser photocoagulation. This is where energy is focused mainly at the retinal pigment epithelium, that pump underneath. It causes a coagulation, which is like a mashup of cells nearby. They're actually getting damaged and break down into a scar, which we see in the pictures down at the bottom here. So these circles are little spots or little scars from the laser where the retinal pigment epithelium has um, been destroyed. And then the outer retina, where those photoreceptors above it has been destroyed too. So we have a window looking back through the eye. Other types of laser work in different ways. We have some that are activated after we put a drug inside one of the blood vessels. So we put some um, a drug in the vein that comes to the back of the eye very quickly and we activate it with the laser. You may have heard of that one. That's called photodynamic therapy or PDT. And we also have some that disrupt. So they have a high acoustic. So they have a big um, uh, um, uh, expansion of um, the cells that splits them apart. And the main one for that is YAG laser. That's post cataract, which I'll talk about a bit later. And then we have some that directly split the bonds in the front clear window of the eye. And that's the one that most people who don't know about the eye and retina um, are um, thinking of when you think about laser eye surgery. So the one that's uh, allowing you to not wear glasses anymore is at the front clear window. And that's a type of photoablation. So retinal laser is PRP or panretinal photocoagulation. P 
Pan means around, and this is to the outside retina. And that's for when new blood vessels form on the outside. Macular laser is for that middle bit, and it's mainly for fluid reduction. So you've got macular edema. Retina pexy is where we um, seal down a tear in the outside of the retina. Um, all of these types of laser are performed by the same laser machine. It's what we'd call conventional retinal laser, but it has a myriad of names just to absolutely confuse you. So it might be called by the medium argon, it might just be called retinal, it might be called by the machine type or by the way it's delivered and Pascal and pattern and all of these different things may be put into play. Um, the other types of lasers that are also used on the retina are some of the newer-ish ones, micro pulse laser, which is sometimes called sub-threshold, and I'll talk about that a bit later, and then PDT, which I mentioned earlier. So who might need retinal laser? Well, PRP is by far most commonly seen in diabetic retinopathy, and second to that, vein occlusion. So be it a central retinal vein occlusion, a branch retinal vein, a hemiretinal vein occlusion, and from any cause, from the most common cause, which is age-related, genetic, or associated with cardiovascular risk factors, or from um, other causes that are a bit more rare. And then also it's used when there is significant change to the back of the eye, to the retina, in, in that there's a lot of oxygen missing and it causes problems at the front of the eye. Uh, that then leads to glaucoma, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Less common indications are when you have some inflammation within the eye that causes a similar sort of oxygen deprivation. And that can also be caused by radiation, Coats disease or sickle cell, which some of you may have heard of or have. So other types of laser. So patients with macular disease, diabetic macular edema and central serous retinopathy being the main one, may require conventional macula or micro pulse laser. And then patients with AMD and a particular subtype, which we call polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, that's about 10% of Western AMD patients will have photodynamic therapy. Another condition, which is where fluid collects underneath the retina, um, and in most patients will self-resolve about 85%, um, is CSR, but in patients who have chronic central serous retinopathy, so the fluid doesn't go away, they may also need this PDT. Cyclodiode, it's a different type of laser that happens to the outside of the eye, and that's indicated when patients have high pressure that can't be managed by drops or tablets. And then the ones that are, are, are less common, uh, so femtosecond laser is associated with cataract surgery, which is not used very much. But YAG laser is used a lot after cataract surgery, and patients with retinal disease are much more likely to have cataract surgery. I'll talk a little bit about photobiomodulation at the end, which isn't really um, laser, but is something that has been um, spoken about recently. So what's PRP and why do we have it? So the eye has the highest oxygen demand in all of the body and is active day and night. And um, sometimes from a narrowing of the blood vessels, uh, from adjacent blood vessels being thickening, or from the inherent problems with the walls of the blood vessels, there can be a lack of oxygen coming to the tissue. So the retina loses its oxygen supply. The eye thinks, I'm going to try and get some more oxygen it sends out some signals and the main signal it sends out of of this pathway is VEGF which you'll have heard of vascular endothelial growth factor so it's like trying to grow new blood vessels so vascular means uh, blood um, and um, so in response to the lacking of oxygen it will form these new blood vessels and although this sounds very good and there's a picture here of a new blood vessel on the optic nerve at the end of the nerve, which we call a disc. Although this sounds very, very good, um, they're actually very fragile. Um, they're fragile and they bleed, and they can bleed underneath the retina, um, and they can bleed uh, into the space at the back of the eye most commonly. If we put some dye in, we can see these 
um, uh, different blood vessels on this picture here. So we can put some dye into the blood vessel that travels to the back of the eye very quickly, and it should stay within the blood vessels. And in this picture here, you can see lots of blood vessels that are all looking very neat and tight with a dye inside. And then this glow of white behind, which is the underlying layer of blood vessels, the choriocapillaris. But on the outside here, there's complete blackness, and that's because all the blood vessels have died off. So all the retina has died off because all the blood vessels are no longer giving it oxygen. So these big patches here of abnormal change is the dye going into the new blood vessels. And then we can see here in a patient who has these new blood vessels has got some hemorrhage underneath the retina. So this is one of the most common causes of visual um, loss or this where you can't see anything on the retina because in the back space here, we've got hemorrhage inside the jelly. So these new blood vessels are ineffective and really we don't want to see them because on top of these two main causes for uh, visual loss, they can also cause a detached retina in some cases and they can also cause growth in the front chamber of the eye, which leads to a painful eye with high pressure, I'm afraid. So what do we do the laser for? So what we're trying to do is to switch off the pathway. And um, so the laser aims to cause burns or spots to the outside of the retina um, and essentially causing some destruction in order to improve um, the, um, the process where the VEGF is not released as much and the new blood vessels shrink off. So in this picture here, we can see that this patient here uh, who has blood vessels at the middle part of the um, nerve here has had lots and lots of spots of laser all around the outside retina, but not in this middle bit where the macula is. So the hope is that the laser then causes scarring of the new blood vessels, so they shrink back or that they dis disappear completely. So laser has been around um, for, for many, many years. And conventional laser, as, as we you know once knew it, was probably from around the 80s until um, about 2010. And um, I'll talk about a couple of the big studies in diabetes that, that you know, started us on this very, very well recognized course of treatment. Um, so laser spots uh, are... Um, as I discussed, um, focused on the retina, and we used to put a significant amount of um, uh, spots on, which were delivered with a uh, longer burn and lower power. But over recent years, we've changed. And in the past 10, 20 years, we have a newer type of laser, which is um, with a higher power, but a lower um uh, lower amount of time to deliver, which means that actually we can deliver a lot more quickly, which gives one advantage in that it's less painful, but also the collateral damage is um, something that we're trying to reduce. So we're trying to reduce the complications of the laser on the outside, because although the laser helps in one aspect, the worry is, is that it, it causes problems in another aspect. So why do we use PRP or pan-retinal photocoagulation in diabetic retinopathy. Well, back in the 80s or very late 70s, a very important trial um, under the umbrella of the diabetic retinopathy studies was performed. And this looked at whether or not patients had laser or didn't have laser in various types of diabetic retinopathy. And very quickly it became apparent, so apparent that the study was modified, um, that having laser reduced the risk of severe visual loss in diabetics. Now, this was a good while ago, and so the numbers relate to how diabetes on the whole was treated back then, which is not as good as it is today, how laser was given, which is not quite the same as it is today, and the type of laser then. But the sentiment is still the same, that having laser reduced your risk of visual loss, and severe visual loss is... Um, not being able to see the top of the chart for two visits over a four month period. Um, so reduced your risk of severe visual loss um, in all eyes who had laser with certain criteria. And these criteria were high risk criteria. So if the blood vessels were, the new blood vessels were in a particular position or if they'd caused hemorrhage. So we can see that in an untreated eye, uh, we would, I'm just highlighting here that 
a quarter of patients would have severe visual loss at two years, but that was reduced down to 11% at uh, if they had laser. And this was a f- over 50% reduction in um, their visual loss and consistent across all the groups. So in all eyes, we see that laser reduces the risk of severe visual loss by over 50%. And if not performed over four years, so a doubling of the time without treatment, the um, risk of severe visual loss also increases by double. What's important about this study is is that it didn't show that having laser when you didn't have the high risk criteria, so when you had milder disease, helped in any way. What the study also didn't show was um, if we should give laser early. And that's where the second big study at a similar time over a 10 year period, 80s to 90s, the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy showed. So they showed that actually it's better to give it earlier in the course of this disease. So before you see the higher risk signs, and that's why we have diabetic eye screening, and that's why you're monitored closely in the hospital eye service, because we know that This study told us that if we give laser earlier on, it helps patients from progressing to a later stage of retinopathy. And that's why our college guidelines um, highlight that we should give laser to any patient who has any sign of um, neovascularization. Um, You might want to ask, well, should I have treatment before I develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy? So the ETDRS study, the one that we just discussed, um, didn't actually split the early PDR, so the early proliferative and the ones without, um, out. Um, they didn't separate them in the study. Um, but what we know is, is that um, there's no definite evidence for giving panretinal photocoagulation to severe non-proliferative, but that many of these patients end up developing proliferative very soon afterwards. So close monitoring is really important. And in some patients on an individualized basis, it will be better that you have laser before you develop the proliferative signs. So in my clinic, I will often take extra care with patients who are on the borderline. We will perform a fluorescein angiography to make sure that there isn't any peripheral disease because recent very good studies from a, a, a big group in the states who have um, uh, who have influenced lots of international care show that seeing peripheral changes in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy um, will um, will be um, at a higher risk of them having a vitreous hemorrhage so some patients particularly those who have had previous problems in the other eye and maybe have only one eye where they have a difficult view to get to the retina or they have the, um, uh, they have a cataract which they need to have performed soon, which might accelerate diabetic retinopathy, would benefit from earlier treatment. And so though this isn't in all nas- international guidelines, um, it's something that will definitely be considered on an individual basis. So here, for those of you that can see the um, chart, I've got a picture of a few different patients with this condition. So here I'm looking at an eye straight on with uh, the optic nerve there and the blood vessels here. These all look very normal, but you can see some spots. These small spots here are little blood um, leakages, so little hemorrhages or microaneurysms associated with diabetes, which is very common in almost all patients who've had diabetes for a significant period of time. But down here, we see something is going on. We've got a twisty blood vessel up here. We see something is going on a twisty blood vessel. And if we put some dye in, we can see that these patches here are lighting up with the dye. So instead of staying in the normal blood vessels, it's starting to come out. And that's because all around here, the complete blackness is where the lacking of oxygen is that we've already discussed. And then as the dye works through, it leaks out. And this is the problem, the leaking out of the dye um, that causes the visual loss from hemorrhage. Again, in this eye, we see that there's significant blood vessels here and here that leaks out in later frames because of this lacking of oxygen in the patient's other eye. So what do we do? We perform significant laser and the laser here is good. It's all around the outside, sparing the middle. And um, we're hoping that these blood vessels start to shrink and move down. But this patient had a vitreous hemorrhage here. And so vitreous hemorrhage can sometimes stop us from being able to perform laser. And um, what we do about that, I'll discuss in a moment or two. 
This here is an only eye patient who's got significant outside lacking of oxygen. All of this has gone out, so there's no supply there. And though he just only has a very tiny little blood vessel here, it certainly leaks. And in an only eye, quick treatment is important. So for those of you who haven't had laser treatment before, how is it given? Well, on the day you come, you have a visual acuity test. You measured on the chart. You're dilated, so your pupils are made big. You won't be able to drive home from that, but also because the laser is very dazzling. And not to be worried if you feel completely dazzled without any vision for the rest of the day, it will come back the next day. Uh, you sit in a chair like this, which is usually in front of a table that's all attached to the laser, but sometimes it's just the regular microscope. The laser can sometimes be given on the microscope with these additional machines I've just shown. You sit in um, a chair here, and this is you facing at the laser. You have a little chin rest that you put your head in, and then you pop your head forward on the top rest. And it's important to be comfortable, and the chair moves in all sorts of ways, and also to discuss with the person who's giving your laser how you want to communicate and how you want um, um, to say that you need a break, because you can stop during the treatment. It's not like an operation where you can't have a break in between. You'll have lots of anaesthetic. The anaesthetic will be given in the eye. And once the eye is completely numb at the front, we'll be able to put this type of laser here, uh, this type of lens on to deliver the laser here. So this is the view from my end. And this is the view from your end. And this little bit here that sits on the eye can be various sizes, some a bit bigger than others. Um, and that will have some gel on, which often runs down the face um, and needs to be topped up, uh, but doesn't cause any discomfort. It will stop you from blinking um, and you might feel it on your eyelids, but it shouldn't hurt on the eye. I asked a few of my patients how they felt about the laser and they gave a variety of responses here. I've had many treatments and wouldn't choose it, but it's manageable. It feels strange, maybe some discomfort at times, particularly around where the nerves are and that can be uh, warned of beforehand, but it's not painful. Uh, it's very bright and the bright light is the most difficult. Now, patients also say that they could not manage at times. These are few and far between, and most patients manage absolutely fine with this procedure um, under local anesthesia. Some patients manage a whole session at once. Some patients have it um, fractionated, so they have it a little bit at a time, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but if you can't manage, there are other options. So we can give you additional anaesthetic. We can give you um, some anaesthetic around the eye, which is like an injection around the eye to make the eye stop feeling the uh, light, uh, bright light, um, and also to um, completely numb it. Um, and then also we can give it if you're reclining in a chair with a bit of sedation, if um, we use a different type of uh, laser that um, is controlled from a headpiece. Occasionally, patients do need a general anaesthetic, and we go to theatre to have this. Some patients say that the surgeon couldn't manage. Now, this is also quite rare, but if you have a very small pupil or a cataract, um, then we might um, not be able to perform the surgery, and we might give you some uh, injections uh, to temporise the problems that we think are behind the hemorrhage or behind the cataract whilst we do the operation for the cataract surgery and then the laser promptly afterwards. So what can go wrong with the laser? We know now that it's a good thing in certain cases and the majority of those proliferative diabetic retinopathy, but also vein occlusions. Um, uh, but what problems can occur? So not side effects now, but complications, which means longer lasting, possibly permanent changes. So macular fluid, so fluid within the layers and possibly underneath the layer, of the macula can occur after um, PRP. Um, and if we look at two groups, if we look at a group that hasn't had PRP and has, about 12% might develop macular edema, but 16% in um, one study who had PRP. So a 4% increased risk for them. Now, Visual loss can also come from vitreous hemorrhage, not related to the diabetes, but actually from the laser. And this is quite uncommon, but if there's a rapid shrinking of the blood vessels, which we want, sometimes that pulling away from the jelly can cause a little bit of hemorrhage, but that would hopefully settle and not be as severe as the hemorrhage that is um, going to happen with the standard disease, but um, sometimes it can last a bit longer. Less common side effects that are not normally noticed by the patient are changing their 
contrast sensitivity, so greys, blacks, and all in between. Um, their colour vision can be a little bit more washed out, but usually that's something that's found in um, testing within research studies, and we don't normally test for that in the clinic. Um, and then the one that most patients are worried about, um, and the one that has the um, biggest fear, is the effect on driving vision. So before I talk about driving vision, um, I'll just uh, mention about how there is an alternative. And that alternative is a drug that you may well know about, which is the anti, so against the VEGF. So that's what we use for diabetic macular edema. That's what we use for AMD and lots of other things too. And um, there, are, there are long trials with good evidence for Lucentis and ILEA that show regular treatment can match and potentially have less side effects than laser itself. But the issue with these is that every clinical institution, every provider um, can sometimes not be able to deliver your injection either because they're away or they've got problems within their clinic or they've got a long waiting list or you're away or you're sick and you can't have or you've got an infection, and you can't have the injections. And so being in a situation where you've had no laser and the anti VEGF has run out, puts you back at that very high risk of having complications of visual loss from the diabetes. And so for that reason, and there are a good number of trials, one of which I've put here, that show that patients who come back having only had anti VEGF and no laser can be in a bad place. So it's not encouraged um, as, a, um, as, as an option um, in most patients, and it's not currently NICE approved either. It's good to know about, though, because it can help us in some situations. So vision, of course, is not just looking at the chart. And although often that's what will be the one thing that's um, mentioned when you go to clinic, it is, of course, also color vision and contrast sensitivity. And then also your field of vision. And here we see a one eyed field of vision. So we see the edge of the nose here of the field and the outside. And this is a, a, a patient who's lost all of their vision. So the effect on driving vision is important because it includes both how well you see, but also where you see. And so the DVLA um, uh, will be looking at two things when they assess your driving vision. So visual acuity is really quite easy to um, measure within the clinic because we can tell you if you reach the 612 standard, which is a few lines off the bottom, and your ophthalmologist can tell you how well you've done that. But we don't routinely do the type of field test that you need for your DVLA um, assessment. So remembering that diabetes can affect the vision aside from PRP is really important when we start to think about driving vision. So in the UK, the driving field test relies on how well you see, six over 12, um, and also where you see. And I've put up a picture here of um, a chart, which is a visual field test where you look at with both eyes open and you have 120 flashes that you need to um, click for on the test. And this is called an Esterman field test. Now, you don't need to get all of them to pass your driving test, but you do need to have no significant problem in the middle part of your vision. And you do also need to have a wide field of at least 120 degrees. Otherwise, you won't pass your test. Um, so this person here didn't pass their test because they had not got 120 degrees of field. Now, it's really important that you tell the DVLA if you have had um, a request from your ophthalmologist or optician that your vision is worse than 612 or if you've had laser in both eyes or laser in one eye if the other eye doesn't see. So for a long time, we felt that vision, visual field was significantly affected in um, retinal laser. And a lot of that was from the type of laser um, in the past. Um, before the ETDRS studies, um, with some of the older lasers, we would see rates of up to 50% of failure of field on driving um, testing. But after ETDRS, uh, we have seen that it's probably less than 20% will have a failure of the DVLA licensing. Uh, one nice study in the late 90s had a look and 25% of patients passed their field test. But in only 20% of those failures, it was because of the PRP. So as we're looking much more favorable and 
these studies were all limited because they only look back at patients instead of forward, along with the fact that we have this more modern laser, the multi-spot and way of delivering it, the effect on field loss seems more, um, more uh, negligible. So here we have a picture of what we sort of thinking um, from the most recent uh, studies about who would be affected um, uh, uh, on their DVLA uh, assessment. So the best recent evidence we have, and it's the only UK prospective trial, so that's looking forward, um, which is a much higher level of evidence, is from um, uh, a group in here, a group um, headed by Subash, which looked at 43 patients over six months who had um, retinal laser, but had never had any laser before that. Importantly, both eyes were treated, which is what um, uh, would affect uh, your driving vision because you can drive with just one good seeing eye. Um, uh, both eyes were treated, but the patients didn't have any other eye problems. They had no cataract, no vitreous hemorrhage. They didn't have any glaucoma. They had no difficulty with interpreting tests. Um, and then the tests were performed to see how they performed after the laser, including the UK um, DVLA standard fields. 95% of patients passed before and 92 passed after their laser treatment, which means actually only 3% of patients is one of the follow-up because not everyone was included in the follow-up, which is a bit of limitation, but only 3% failed the laser. So if we're looking at a group of patients, now so we're looking at 100 patients here, it's just these three down here that wouldn't pass if they fit into the model of that research group. Um, so Thinking about that um, research paper, one of the limits is that laser can get make your field worse after six months, and it was only a six-month field. Um, but more importantly, other aspects of your diabetes or your diabetic retinopathy can affect your DVLA testing. Maybe if there's oxygen damage to the centre of the macula or vitreous hemorrhage or preretinal hemorrhage or cataract, as discussed before. Now, thinking of vitreous hemorrhage, it's something that's quite common, actually, more common than people are sometimes um, sometimes realise. And when we looked, um, uh, when you look at studies that compared anti-VEGF versus PRP, um, we see that actually 50 percent had a hemorrhage over five years. And most of those will settle. Um, but in one in 10, they needed a vitrectomy where you go into the back of the eye, take away the jelly um, take away the hemorrhage in order to be able to improve vision, but also to give some laser. So you might find that you're in the position where you've got a vitreous hemorrhage that's causing visual problems, but it's also stopping uh, the clinician from giving the laser. And this is where we know that anti-VEGF will do the same thing. So we can temporize, we can temporarily treat the proliferation with an anti-VEGF whilst we wait for things to clear or for you to have a vitrectomy to then deliver the laser. And this is a scan of um, a B-scan ultrasound of the jelly at the back of the eye. Now, moving on from peripheral and thinking about macular lasers. So macular laser is really quite different. And um, this is a much smaller type of burn, much smaller spot, and a much reduced number of spots. And the idea of it is, is that it aims to reduce uh, leakage and um, stabilize or maybe improve vision. Um, largely stabilizing. So for any cystoid, which just means cystic spaces within the retina, so cystoid macular edema, and that might be from vein occlusion or diabetic macular edema, very, very rarely used for vein occlusion. So again, the same big study, uh, one of the arms of that, the, oh, sorry, one of the um, uh, sub studies of that, the ETDRS recommended that having laser in um, maculopathy was beneficial um, as it reduced visual loss by 50%. What does that mean? If you take 10 patients who had a particular type of diabetic macular edema, six of them would not have visual loss, where visual loss is defined as three lines on the chart at two years, but four of them would. And if they all had laser, then those four would be reduced down to two. So you'd half the 40% to 20%. So you still have a good chance of not getting problems if you don't have the laser. But if you do, your chances risk is reduced slightly. Now, 
The exact mechanism of action is unknown. It possibly closes the leaky microaneurysms. It possibly, they're the little bulging bits that I showed you on the scan before. You can see some here on the um, chart and they're releasing this fatty deposit here within the retina. Possibly improves the um, oxygenation by reducing um, blood flow. But um, laser has now been reserved really until anti-VEGF has been trialed. So if you can use anti-VEGF for centre involving edema, macular laser is not advised. And um, it's often deferred until you tried your anti-VEGF and then seeing what happens. And if there is persisting specific type of um, maculopathy remaining, uh, we might do laser. And that's in about five, maybe 10 percent but at the discretion of the person who's treating you. So the only difference for that is something called subthreshold macular laser, which is becoming more common. So of note, you can't have injections on the UK as dictated by NICE unless your central retinal thickness, so the measurement here, the central retinal thickness is over 400. So laser also is used when patients are not quite able to get their anti-VEGF injections or if we want to prevent them getting to that point. So who might be eligible? Patients with focal laser. Focal means just one small focus. So you might have a tiny patch off center, so not in the middle, because we don't want to damage the middle part of the retina by lasering it, the fovea. So off center focal laser. Patients who don't have a good response to their anti-VEGF or steroid, or maybe patients who just can't manage or have another reason why they can't have their anti-VEGF. And the aim is to prevent um, visual worsening. So in focal laser, you might have one or two spots to the outside like this. And then sometimes in very poor responses or resistant cases, you might have something called a grid laser, which is multiple spots to one area like this. And that's more of a salvage therapy. It's given in exactly the same way. It's much, much quicker, just about five minutes, maybe less. It's really quite painless. In, and that's one thing I didn't talk about which i should have for the pan retinal photocoagulation is that sometimes you do feel a bit of discomfort a bit of burning um, or heat at the back of the eye which um, doesn't last um, too long but in macular laser you don't have this at all um, it takes a bit longer to work or for us to know that it hasn't worked and um, so the follow-up for this is about four months over the other type of laser prp which is about six weeks but the complications in yesteryear were much worse. And the laser scars here are significant on these patients whose pictures I'm showing you at the center of the macula. And this can cause central blind spots, change to your color vision, um, aversion to light. And, and it's something that we really want to avoid. And so not doing laser at all is something that might be advocated by your clinician. And, and many, many um, consultants are using it. Not at all, if much less. But some patients, some consultants are um, advocates for a different type of macular laser. And this one is called subthreshold or below the point at which you'll have one of these burns. And so um, if you think about the conventional laser as delivering constant treatment of energy, this subthreshold or micro pulse laser pulses and it gives a little bit of energy um, um, over a period of time. Trials are a little bit lacking for this, but more recently they have um, uh, been better um, reviews of all studies and a few prospective trials, um, which um, one of which on diabetes came from the UK, and, and, and the use of this is more common. To give you an idea, in my region of East Anglia, about two thirds of consultants would like to have the laser um, and would use it, but only about a quarter do have it, a quarter of units. Um, but that still means there's a good amount of people who are not using it and don't want to. Um, but the consensus would be it's not unsafe. Um, it's comparable to other laser. It's better in early diabetic maculopathy. And the mechanism, not though not fully understood, um, would be better to be standardised for treatment and, and some more trials. I briefly touch on PDT. Um, now, this is a type of photoradiation, so the drugs injected into the eye, um, sorry, drugs injected into the arm, not the eye, uh, comes around, um, and then the laser is um, delivered in a similar way um, to macular laser to um, try and sensitize this drug. 
Um, this is a, a good treatment, but is limited by the drug availability. And the drug availability is very scarce. It's used for the subtype of AMD, which I mentioned before, called PCV or polypoidal disease, um, and also for CSR. And considering there isn't really any other treatment for CSR except the new micropulse laser, newish micropulse laser, um, it's it's a real shame that we can't get this. And even when we could get the drug, it was only in some regional centers. So other types of lasers, are sometimes despite good PRP, despite anti-VEGF, despite tight control, patients will go on to develop blood vessels at the front of the eye. So if we think about that cross section of the eye now, we're looking right at the front here. And then we look here, we can see that actually here, this is the cross section of the colored part of the eye, the iris. Here is where all the fluid is created. And that travels through and then drains out of here. But if you develop blood vessels at the front of the eye here, which we call rubiosis or iris blood vessels, they can track up, which is at this point here, and they can block off the flow. And then blocking off the flow means the pressure goes up and you do end up getting a painful eye. So you need a different type of laser at the front of the eye here under anesthetic in theater to try and reduce that pressure. That's when drops don't work and tablets don't work in patients. And this is common in patients with advanced diabetes or vein occlusion. Finally, non-retinal laser um, uh, is um, common because patients um, of which we do about half a million cataract operations, myself included, doing a good many um, in the UK, uh, we um, see that 25% of patients or almost will have a retinal problem. Um, so if you have a retinal problem, you often have many of the risk factors for cataract. Cataract surgery is very successful where we look at the gain, this front part of the eye. We go in and take a little bit off the capsule, which is the outside shell of the lens, take out the lens from inside and then leave the capsule behind, put a new lens in. But then you might develop clouding at the back here. So a type of laser called a YAG, which disrupts that and can make an opening in the back. And so that's very common, very safe. And despite it dominating this slide, the complications bit, most patients don't have any complications. So if you're going to have a YAG capsulotomy, it's not for your retinal disease, but it's for post cataract. And, and you might get a few floaters. It's delivered in a similar sort of way, but they tend to settle down and people are happy. Finally, photobiomodulation is something that has been um, around for a good while now. Um, it, I thought I'd just put this in because there's a very nice um, pilot study that showed, unfortunately, it didn't have any benefit in diabetic macular edema um, and is not going on to a further phase three study with the DCR net. Um, so this is around and patients ask me about it, but at the moment, photobiomodulation is, is not showing um, anything good for diabetic macular edema or, or anything else that I know of. So in summary, there's a lot of types of laser. We use them for all sorts of things. Its use in retina is widespread, and I've gone through the most common ones here. Um, Pan-retinal photocoagulation is um, is some um, used particularly in diabetes and its side effects are actually quite limited in most and, and does a lot of good. Um, and most patients manage it well with minimal discomfort and rarely having extended time off work or long recovery. And then some laser may be offered when other treatments are not available um, um, uh, for other um, conditions within the eye, um, but they have a little bit less research to the, the ones I've discussed. Lovely picture there, Liam, I'm guessing of your kids. <laughs> oh, is it still there? Yeah, it's a very nice picture. <laughs> Fantastic. Liam, thank you so thank much. Um, sorry oh, if well, I ever ran a bit. No, 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 it's brilliant. And um, I had forgotten, so apologies to everybody if you've been trying to put things in the chat. I'd forgotten that for some reason Zoom has it turned off and I forgot to turn it on. So it's turned on now. Post your questions. Um, so we've got a first question from Karen. She says, um, why is anti-VEGF the preferred treatment for wet AMD over PRP? So it's a completely different disease process. So anti-VEGF, um, though it um, sounds like it's just tackling the new blood vessels, in diabetes is also tackling blood vessels that creep up underneath the retina in macula. 
So these blood vessels that creep up underneath a weak point in the um, supporting layer can leak and bleed. And what we don't want to do is, is we don't want to perform laser to them at the site of the macula. That's what we used to do some time ago, but it causes big scarring. So we don't give PRP because um, there's nothing to switch off in the outside. Cool. And, yeah. and then if anybody's joined us and they've maybe been told, actually, we want to give you a laser treatment, this will be their first what you know? What 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 things do you think they should be asking of the person who's going to be delivering that treatment? You know, I'm I've never had it before. What you know? What do I need to know before my first treatment? Well, do you, I mean that's what I try to cover in the talk, yeah. really. But literally, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of I'm terrified. I haven't taken anything in. If I ask you one question, is it is it you know how long is it going to take? How long is it you know when can I yeah what's What's that kind of number one question for a worried patient? So the vast majority of patients that have laser say it's much worse than um, it's it's it sounds much worse than it is, and actually going through it is absolutely fine. And once you come out the other end, you realise it, it it wasn't too bad at all. Um, not doing anything is is not usually a viable option if you've been offered it because without treatment some um, things might get considerably worse. So um, I'm sure that you'd manage really well with a single day procedure um, that shouldn't cause too much discomfort. You should be back to work quite quickly and hopefully it'll do you lots of good. Yeah. And then I'm going to put you on the spot a bit. So do you think there'll be more developments in terms of laser treatment it getting you know better for a bigger cohort of patients where do you think the potential is to go with using lasers as a treatment so i think you know with the advent of anti vegf it's actually removed a lot of what we do for lasers but this permanent treatment or this longer acting treatment of laser for peripheral disease for outside disease will always be with us um, unless we have something considerably different within gene therapy but that's unlikely yeah. The thing that would be good to know is, is whether or not the lasers that are currently in use that are below threshold, that have less collateral damage, that cause less side effects, particularly for macular pathology, is to have good trials that allow us to standardize treatment. So everyone's doing the same thing with the machines that are out there. And we know that it's actually helping because we don't want to do something that's not helping that might be causing things to be worse when we've got alternative treatments yeah and patients definitely don't want doing want that and yeah. and is there so you you're obviously working across the breadth of macula is, is there one thing at the moment that's getting you most excited that you can see potentially kind of coming on the horizon or 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 are you are you frustrated that things are taking so long to change well, um, I think that would probably move away from laser and it would move towards um, treatment. I think if there was anything that we could have, it would be something that gives comparable outcomes to frequent intervitreal injections. So, But something that was much more robust, lasted a lot, lot longer. I was so disappointed when the port, which, you know, was the um, refillable implant yeah. that you reduce you know had had you know bad real life outcomes but something that lasts a lot lot longer is a lot more durable or hopefully and this is where i'm most excited is something that stops things from happening in the first place so if there's some sort of gene manipulation or therapy yeah yeah, yeah. so no there's um, a lot left to do and possibly coming um, I don't know if laser will be part of that or not, but it's going to be around for a long time and, and certainly needed in, in many, many patients. Yeah, we we had um, <laughs> Naomi Lois spoke a couple of months ago and she was talking about how some of the challenges in the NHS is that some of the clinics have older technology. And actually, what, what can we do about that? Possibly not very much, but it's the impact that that has on patients having their treatment. Yeah. So I think it's because um, the life um, span of technology is probably 10, maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, being encouraged to replace older machines is difficult because they're still working and they're still yeah. doing 
they did do. Um, and so the added benefit of buying something that may cost 100, 150,000 pounds is sometimes not looked favorably upon by the, um, the uh, you know, the people who are providing the funding. So it, it does often come down to funding, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I, I was interested about your comment in terms of actually some of the challenge with injections is we know that people are having delays in treatment that the clinics can't cope and actually having that you know your ability to have the laser would mean that you're not then having to queue or wait or you know have your treatment delayed then that's a good thing yes if it and that's what but we need we need better evidence to suggest that's true so certainly with conventional macular laser except for that small subtype where we have a focal spot um, there is um, it's not going to prevent you from getting to that point. But what we do know is, is we know that if patients have good vision, and there's a very nice trial from this group in the States, if patients have good vision and they wait, then as long as they're monitored correctly, if they develop macular edema and diabetes a bit later on, whether or not they go on to have laser or anti-VEGF, they get to the same point at two years. So actually watching and waiting is okay. And sometimes what you want is you just want the reassurance that actually if I wait and, and watch this, it's not a problem. Um, so treating is not always the, the thing that we want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anne has asked a question about dry MD. And if you have a look at our website, macularsociety.org, there's a load of information about what's going on with the potential new treatments that are coming through for for dry AMD. So so check them out. And there's there's old webinar um films all about that as well liam thank you so much for your time tonight um i hope you all found that uh, really interesting i certainly learned loads um so next month's webinar is shelly black and claire kirk um shelly is a study coordinator and research optometrist at the northern ireland clinical research network and she's going to be talking about their current and upcoming research studies and claire is a genetic counselor and she's going to be talking about the genetics of inherited retinal diseases and the advancement of genetic therapies and then um, don't forget um, we turn all this content into podcasts um, so our most recent episode came out last week and it was on Salisbury fundus dystrophy with Andrew Lotary and we have a new episode twice a month on the first and third Thursday uh, the podcast is called my macular and me and it can be found on all popular podcasting platforms um, Liam thank you so much everybody thank you so much for your time um, look after yourselves and we will see you all next month. Bye. Bye.